Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. David Brooks, of course, is columnist at the New York Times. He writes uh, for The Atlantic. He appears regularly on the Brooks and Capehart section of PBS NewsHour on Fridays. He's written many, many books and been on the show many (laughs) times. But now he has written a new book that was one of my favorites of the year in the top 10 favorite books of the year called How to Know a Person. The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. David, welcome back. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. I'm going to keep coming till I say something smart. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for including my book in the top 10 books of the year. I, I'm honored. Somebody told me about that a couple of days ago, so I was tickled pink. I hope your own book, Losing My Religion, is in there somewhere in the top 10. It should be in your top 10. <laughs> no, not in, my, not in my own list, no. I want to talk a little bit later about October 7th and the debate after and some of these uh, events, but first... I have a theory as I was reading this book because I've noticed something with you. There is a a really cheering sort of heartwarming aspect to the way that you look at your wife, Anne, when she's, you know, at a table talking or when she's up uh, speaking somewhere. There's just a kind of a glow that, that you have looking at her. And I'm wondering if being married to Anne, your marriage, actually maybe taught you some of these things, just the nature of that relationship that you then were able to reflect on. Does that make yeah. sense? Do you think there's I think there's a to lot that? to that. I mean, she really has come into my life in the last seven years and a little, little longer. And uh, of course, love has been transformational when you're deeply in love with a woman. It's bound to soften your heart and introduce new aspects of yourself to yourself. When we first got married, Pete, all her friends kept coming up to me, and especially guys who had been courting her, and saying, you know, you are really lucky. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know, I'm really lucky. And they say, no, you're really, really ridiculously lucky. And I say, you yeah, know, but I like to think I bring something to the table in this marriage myself. And they say, no, you're just ridiculously lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and so I definitely over, I, I set the uh, world record in marrying above my station. But if I could tell you one story, if for people who have the video here, I, I'm sitting in my living room here in Washington, D.C., and I was at this very table about seven or eight years ago, no, less than that, maybe five years ago. And I tell this story in the book, and I'm reading some boring book for work. And I look up, and to my right is uh, our front door, which you can see from the, the dining room table. Mm-hmm. And Anne walks in, she opens the door, and it's summertime, and the sun is streaming in behind her. And she walks in and pauses on the threshold. And I'm sitting at the table, and she doesn't even... She's not even conscious that I'm there in the room because that's the kind of charisma I project. And I have this sensation coming over my (laughs) head, which was, I know her. I really know her. I know her through and through. Mm -hmm. And it was this great sense of really knowing another human being. And if you had asked me what I knew about her at that moment, it wasn't like the personality traits I would describe her or the biographical things I would use to capture her for a stranger. It was just sort of had this sensation I know the whole ebb and flow of her being, the lifts and harmonies of her music. And I just, it was almost as if I wasn't seeing her, I was Mm -hmm. seeing out from her. And the only word I can use to describe how Mm -hmm. I was looking at her was beholding. I wasn't like inspecting her or observing Mm -hmm. her, I was just beholding her, which is this, obviously a churchy word, It's, it's this sense of just being gratefully observant and in the presence of a person you just want to be there and, and appraise and just honor and appreciate. And I told this story to some friend of mine who are a little older than me, and they said, you know, that's what we do with our grandkids. Sometimes when we're just hanging around our grandkids, mm-hmm. we just behold them. And it felt great. 
It felt great. Mm. And so it, the book is really about the pleasures of being seen when somebody really gets you. But the pleasures of seeing someone, especially in that way, are just as good. You know, you mentioned in the in the book at the beginning about encouraging people to see another person as a soul. Yeah. And you and you step back and say, I know you may not believe that there is a soul, but I'm talking about that that spark that you say can't be measured or weighed or or evaluated in that way. How do you communicate the idea of soul? I mean, it seems to be what you're doing there is saying to someone who might just think that everything's material. You actually don't. You actually you actually yeah. do think there's more to a person than this. Do you find that difficult, sort of helping people to see that they see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I write mostly for a secular audience. I write for the New York Times, which we call non-Christianity today. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, and so I, I, my, my, you know, I write for religious people too, but often I write for non-religious people, and I tell my pastor friends that I'm I'm the gateway drug to you. So I, I try to. Hmm. Uh, lighten up people's sense of their spiritual life. Uh, and the way I phrase it is, I say, you know, you can believe in God or you cannot believe in God, but I ask you to believe that there's some piece of you that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but has infinite value and dignity. And every person has this. And we're not equal on the level of our brain power. We're not equal on the level of our muscle power, but we're equal on the level of our souls. And so, hmm. you know, this is weirdly how I, and the coda is that, if you treat everybody you meet as if they have a soul of infinite value and dignity, you're going to probably wind up treating them well. It's just a shorthand. There was this guy, Aziz Ansari, this comedian, and he got into sort of scandal. He was in a date, and it, I guess it went horribly wrong, and she accused him of some sort of abuse, and he came back and said, no, it was just awkwardness. But if, you, if you're on a date with somebody and you just treat them as they have a soul of infinite value and dignity, you're not going to get yourself into trouble. <laughs> you're going to treat them with respect. Mm. And I have to say... I think you can believe in a soul if you're an atheist. You, you know, the reason mm -hmm. we can't kill another human being is because that person has an irreplaceable soul. And I think you can't really see another human being unless you treat them with that, you greet them with that level of reverence and respect. And just in terms of my own coming yeah. to faith, this was well over 10 years ago. I didn't come to faith, frankly, through God at first. I came to faith through souls. And so I'm sitting in, this was, I mm -hmm. remember it was the spring of, 20, of 2013, I'm sitting in the ugliest spot on the face of the earth. If, if you've ever been to Penn Station in New York City, you've been to the second ugliest spot <laughs> in New York City. The only uglier spot <laughs> is the subway station next to Penn Station on 8th Avenue and 33rd Street. Hmm. And I'm there one morning, and I look around the subway car, and I just have this sense that all these people have souls, and that their souls hmm. are soaring, or their souls are sick, their souls are longing, their souls are empty, their souls are full but they all have some piece of them that, that is just yearning for something transcendent and that is a piece of transcendence. And then once I mm. came to see that, that people have souls. That sounds a lot like, uh, that sounds like a similar experience to Thomas you know, Merton's. I, in, in after that, after I had this experience, like five years later, I was reading Thomas Merton and he had a similar experience. And then I, I read another Catholic woman, I can't remember, but other people have had similar experiences where they're just surrounded, often in public transportation, it turns out, but where they have a <laughs> sense of, of that we're all ensouled creatures. And once I believed that humans have souls, that it was a pretty short step to there must be a, a soul of a soul of the universe. There must be a God. I thought at one point while reading your book about a mutual friend of ours, John, who's not a believer at all, is an atheist, but who who seems to get the soul really well when it comes to this idea of seeing people, respecting people in a warm kind of way. Yeah. How does somebody learn to? I mean. How would you explain how somebody knows how to do that? Because I don't think that for many people, it's a sitting back and step by step. They're deciding to do it. They just do it. I think some people have the ability to just take delight in all human beings. It's that question of delight, that sense that, a, you know, if you're going to see a person, well, you have to know what a person is. And if you think a person is a, as just a, a collection of objects or a collection of personality traits, then you're not really seeing the full depths of that person. You can, you can be a very conscientious nun, but you can also be a very conscientious Nazi. So there's something beyond personality mm. traits. And so to me, every person you meet yeah. is unique in some way. Every person you meet is uh, not a problem to be solved, but they're a mystery that will never be to, got to the bottom of. And if, if you approach with that level of reverence, then you'll end up seeing them well. 
because you'll know there's no way to pigeonhole them. There's no way to stereotype them. There's no way to reduce them to a thing. And the, the one thing, and I think this is true of our friend John, he loves conversation and disquisition. He loves the back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so the worst way to see somebody is like a butterfly you pin onto a, a sheet of paper because you're treating them as a dead object. Mm -hmm. But the best way to see someone is having a conversation with them and having that back and forth. And it's a mutual exploration of each other's mysteries. And I think our friend John just likes mm -hmm. that level of conversation. And so the, my book is subtitled, yeah. The Art of Seeing Others and Being Deeply Seen. And I gave it that subtitle because I thought, you know, it'll make it clear what the book's about. But if I'm honest, it should have been subtitled, The Art of Hearing Others and Being Deeply Heard. Because it's the essential human mm -hmm. act of getting to know another person is the, is the art of, of conversation, of what we're doing now. The other person I thought about that you mentioned in the book is Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how Oprah said that you had grown uh, quite a bit, which is, I mean, that's as, as much of an expert opinion as, <laughs> as anyone can get from someone who's always in connection with people. There are certain kinds of people who seem to be able to provoke conversation and self-disclosure yeah more than than others. I even found myself saying to someone one time, you're like Oprah Winfrey. When I'm with you, I find myself saying things that I wouldn't ordinarily <laughs> right. say to somebody. What are the traits there that that cause somebody yeah. to be like Well, let that? me say to another mutual friend of ours, a guy who formerly affiliated with Christianity, Andy Crouch. And so one of my rules to being a great mm -hmm. conversationalist is be a loud listener. And so if anybody knows Andy or has heard him when you're talking to him, it's like you're talking to a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church. He's like, uh-huh, yes, yes, I agree, amen. Preach that, preach. And I just love talking to that guy. And <laughs> He's yeah. a loud listener. And if, yeah. you go, if you go on TV or YouTube and look at an Oprah interview, she doesn't, she'll grunt and groan along, like she'll, but you'll see her face. Her face is just always reflecting yeah. the emotion she sees in the other person. And that's just a way to pull you in because the other particip person is participating in what you're trying to express. And so that's, I think that's one thing. The second thing is not to be afraid of going there. And so one of my favorite stories in the book mm -hmm. is of a friend of mine named Naomi Way, who was teaching eighth grade boys how to be a good interviewer, how to ask good questions. And she says, I'll go to the front of the room and you ask me any question you want and I'll answer honestly, I promise. And so the first boy asks a question, are you married? And she says, no. And the second boy says, are you divorced? And she says, yes. The third boy says, do you still love him? And she's like, whoa, where, where did this come from? And tears come to her eyes. And she says, yes. And the fourth boy says, does he know? Do your kids know? And the kids just kept hammering away. And kids are fantastic at question asking. As adults, I think we lose a little yeah. of that because we get a little shy. We don't want to invade somebody's privacy. But the people who pull stuff out of you, pull stories out of you, they are the ones who are not afraid to ask big questions, questions that take an yeah. average conversation and turn into a memorable conversation. So it's like, if this five years is a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? If we met a year from now, what would we be celebrating? Or I asked a question at a dinner party, how do your ancestors show up in your life? We all know we're affected by our ancestry, our heritage. And suddenly when people ask those questions in a respectful way, then suddenly most people, and I find in my life experiences, almost all people, want to tell their life story. They think like, uh, like how many times in my life have I respectfully asked somebody about their life story and had them say, none of your damn business? The answer is zero, <laughs> zero. Yeah. People are dying to tell you their life story. They just need to be asked. There's almost nothing more pleasurable. And people have studied this. People enjoy telling their life story more than they like making money. And so if you give them a chance mm. to talk about themselves and you're genuinely respectful and curious and you talk a little about yourself, then that's how Oprah does it. They will, people will talk. You talk about in the book how, I think you're quoting someone else at this point saying, no one really ever gets over high school no. or never really gets out of high school and all the dynamics in high school. What was high school like for you? Well, I, I had already embarked on the career I'm on. I, like at age seven, I knew I wanted to become a writer. And so I, mm. I was writing and I was 
defining myself as a writer in those days. And I was on the debate team, which turned out to be helpful to me because all my friends who played football, they have no cartilage left in their knee, but I, I can still go running because <laughs> I, I wasn't damaging my cartilage on the debate team. <laughs> and so I, I, if you want to know socially who I was, there were the cool kids, like the cheerleaders and the football players. And then there were the nerds who like learned Hobbit languages and stuff like that. And I was in the group in between. <laughs> And so that's who I was in high school. And it's a pretty good lesson. Who were you in high school and how has it changed? And my friend says yeah. that you never leave. The, the insecurities you had in high school are still somewhere in there. And I had a friend who was a movie critic at the Wall Street Journal. And she interviewed, I won't say his name because I, I think this was off the record. She interviewed one of the top directors in Hollywood. And you would all know his name. And she interviewed him the day after he came back from his, whatever, 25th high school reunion. And the my friend said, what was it like to go back to a high school reunion as you? Like, you just conquered the world. And he said, I reverted immediately back to the nerdy little guy in the corner filled with anxiety that I was. And I, I had a miserable time because I just felt like such a loser. And so that's testimony that maybe we carry around our high school anxieties forever. You know, I laughed very early on in your book when you talked about how growing up as a child sitting around the table, you all would talk about the evolutionary roots of lactose intolerance yeah. or, or something, along those, something along those lines. And then later, when you're talking about how those early household experiences, even before the, the early school experiences, shape people in, in so many ways, whether somebody's avoidant or neurotic or, or so forth. How, when there's so much genuine trauma right now, do you think we're kind of getting it lost when everything is pictured as trauma? Yeah. Or, you know, I've seen situations where just normal disagreement is, is seen as bullying and intimidation. And I think, you know, there's a lot of genuine bullying and intimidation. And if everything is that, it's going to get lost. How do we talk about those kinds of things? Yeah, better in your view? I've got a ways to go. I confess, I, I ran this nonprofit called Weave, the Social Fabric Project. And we had a bunch of interns who were like 20 years old. We had about 14 one summer. And they kept getting traumatized. And I finally had to tell them, you have to give me some patience here. Because when I was coming up, trauma hadn't yet been invented. And that's, of course, not true. People are traumatized <laughs> by war. But as a developed concept that's so much in the conversation, I do think we have overlabeled. There's real trauma in the world. There's rape, there's abuse, there's violence. But we have so overlabeled things as trauma. And the worst parts are people self-labeling as trauma. And one of the things you notice about who uses mm -hmm. the word, I just saw a study on the airplane today. It's way, it, the word feeling a sense I've been traumatized is very ideologically uh, connected. And so people on the left are much more likely to say, I've, been, I've experienced trauma than people on the right. And that, that shouldn't happen. Psychology is not a left or right thing. Psychology is just human nature. And so I think when you do yeah. extrapolate and say, I've been traumatized when you haven't been, or when you've just suffered, you know, a painful experience, then you're sort of robbing yourself of agency. And you're saying there's something yeah. has happened to me and I'm damaged. And that's just not a way to go out into the world with a, a sense of agency, a sense of control. And when most people go to a therapist, for example, they go because their life story has stopped working. And often because they ca get causation wrong, they blame other people for things they caused, or they blame themselves for things other people caused. But often they've lost a sense of agency. They tell a story about themselves in which they're powerless. And the job of a therapist, or for other people, the job of a friend, is to serve as a story editor and say, let's retell your story in which you're the hero here, in which you have control. And, and that's, that's a story you can live and live a happy life according to. But a story in which you're the victim, which you're the, you're the one being acted upon, that's, a, to me, a non-functioning life story for most people, and unless they have genuinely been traumatized, in which case they need more professional care than I'm talking about here. There were two sections of the book that I wondered how to reconcile. I know you can reconcile them, but I wanted to ask you about it. You mentioned, you talk about Frederick Buechner's experience uh, with the suicide of his father, and which shows up in not just in Telling Secrets that you cited, but in so many of his writings, and about how he repressed mm. the, the grief of that, and it expressed itself later on. But in another point, uh, at another point in the book, you say that 
introspection is not the way no. to get through this. So if it's not introspection and sort of trying to figure out what what's kind of at the root of everything, how do you navigate? What should Beekner have done yeah. well, I think earlier? That's something I've thought about, and I, I don't have a near answer. I think the, the problem with introspection that many people, when they're journaling, say, they settle for easy answers. We're, we're very hard. It's very hard for us to know ourselves by ourselves. So you, ha you settle for an easy answer that is probably a rationalization. You say, I've just had a profound insight into myself, but the research shows it's probably a rationalization. And I have friends who are mm -hmm. constantly, they're telling me about their moments of enlightenment. They're realizing this thing and that thing about themselves. And then you say, well, what exactly did you realize about yourself? And they don't have an answer. They just had some feeling of, of revelation about themselves. I think Beekner's a little different and writers are a little different because even though Beekner is writing alone, he's writing for an audience. And so to me, what, what mm -hmm. he's doing as a writer is not all that different than what we're doing as conversationalists. He's writing for a public. Mm -hmm. And the, the reader may be an only imagined conversational partner, but that conversational partner is there. And the act of writing your life, and as you said, I think, he, I think I've read three different books on the death of his dad and his attempt to discover how to grieve. And you can see him, as I mentioned earlier, he's story editing. He's, he's like pick, picking the story one more level deep. And he's getting to the point in Telling Secrets, the, that book he wrote, the title comes from his a passage in there where he says, you know, it's important that we learn to tell our secrets from time to time. And we do that because it gets us beneath the phony story we present the world so the world will like us. But then he says, it's also important to tell our secrets because it makes it easier for somebody else to tell their secrets to us. And that's how real relationship is yeah. built. And Beekner says in that book, what we want most in the world is to be seen in our fullness. And what we fear most is to be seen in our fullness. We want people to really see us, but we're afraid they won't like us or whatever. And so I think in that act of writing, what Beekner is doing is almost like an act of conversation. And frankly, in my act of writing this book, it's a presentation for the public. It's not just me noodling on my own. Like, I'm not going inward. I'm, here's my story. I'm going to try yeah. to tell it as honestly as I can. You mentioned one time about a Q&A time, I think it was in Oklahoma, where a woman said, what do you do when you no longer want to be alive? Would your answer to her be different now? after this process of writing yeah, for sure. And so I, I didn't know what to say. I was just, it was one of those questions and I didn't know who this person was. And the question came on an index card, so I didn't even have her face. And so much a bit to my shame, mm -hmm. I, I just passed it by and didn't answer. And now I think I'd say a few things. First, I'd say, I admire you for your courage that you're still here. You're in a lot of pain, clearly, but you're willing to fight, fight back. And that doesn't mean people who succumb are, don't have courage. It just means I admire you because you're here. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think I would say to that person is let's just face the reality of the situation. This sucks. The depression you're experiencing, mm -hmm. it just sucks. And I want you to tell me about how, what it's like for you. And we had a, another friend, um, Michael Gerson. And when he was suffering from depression, he had these lying voices in his head, which he talked about in a great sermon at the National mm -hmm. Cathedral. And the voices said, you're worthless, nobody would miss you if you're gone. You're worthless, nobody would miss you if you're gone. And so if somebody like that is not going to feel alone in his depression, he has to be able to communicate, this is what's happening inside me right now. And as Mike said, depression, for those of us lucky enough to have never have experienced depression, you can't understand it by extrapolating from your moments of sadness. That's not what depression is. Depression, as Mike wrote, was, is a malfunction in the instrument you use to determine reality. He's not seeing the real world. His mind is, as I said, lying. He's seeing a distorted world. So I want to try to at least show a little that I, I can understand what you're going through. The third thing I would say is, and I got this from another mutual friend of ours, a pastor, a Baptist pastor named Chris Davis, which is, I want more for you. I want more for you. And that doesn't mean those words will do any good. They will not do any good. But at least you're saying, I express goodwill to you. The fourth thing I would do is constant touches, a text here, a call there, just saying, I'm thinking of you, no need to respond. And what that sends the message is, mm -hmm. I'm not going anywhere. 
that you're not going to be alone. I'm yeah. not going anywhere. And then the final thing I think I learned, I would say, is what I got something from Viktor Frankl. Uh, he wrote this great book, Man's Search for Meaning, after surviving the Nazi death camps. And when he was counseling somebody who was contemplating suicide, he said, life has not stopped expecting things of you. And that seems, the first time I read it, mm -hmm. that, seemed, that seems harsh. Somebody's contemplating suicide and you say, life has not stopped expecting things of you. That sounds a little harsh, like you're putting a burden on them. But I trust Frankel. I mean, I think in those circumstances, people want to be told their life is still important. Their life has meaning in the world and that they can do great good. And the very fact that they have endured this pain gives them credibility to minister to the pain of the world. And there's a beautiful quote I also got from Chris Davis, which is um, from Thornton Wilder. And he, I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, their very suffering makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men. And said, in love's service, only the wounded soldiers can serve. And so you can say to the person, you have great gifts to give to the world precisely because you are, you've endured what you've endured. And so there are all, all, those are all things I have learned that one should say to a person who's in these terrible circumstances. Will those things make a difference? Not necessarily. But we can still try to be present gracefully with the other person. And that's really what I'm trying to do. Yeah. What I was trying to do the last four years while researching the book, to learn, you know, it's important to be open-hearted toward other people. But it's important to be skilled, to know exactly what to say. And so in the book, I try to say, here's some of the things you might say to someone who's depressed. Some of the things you might say to someone who's contemplating suicide. So I, I'd hope I'd have a slightly better answer than the non-answer I gave to that person a couple of years ago in Oklahoma. You did something in the book that I would not have thought possible, which is your writing prompted me to have compassion for a mass shooter <laughs> or a would-be mass shooter because you were talking about someone who was who was caught by police before he did something terrible with a trunk full of guns and that he said he was such an outcast and that really described what it was like to be him. And then you said, we think of these shooters as loners, but they're actually just bad joiners. And I'm wondering, how can we help address that? I mean, when, when you think about loneliness, you think about it, it doesn't seem that the church writ large is really addressing this well. Mm -hmm. How can we start to do that? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of the book is about dehumanization and humanization. And we evolved to be surrounded by 150 people who would look out for us. And we feel safe when they're, we're being watched. We need that kind of recognition. We need people to be seeing us or else we feel existentially unsafe. And so if you're one of these young men in high school and no one knows you, and if you read the profiles of them case after case, they're just ghosts in high school. No one knows them. They have no friends. They're living in their own head. And then they feel when you're not seen, when you're rendered invisible by the world, you regard it as an injustice, which it is, and you wanna lash out. You wanna to prove to the world you exist. And so what they do is they basically, mm -hmm. with mass shooters, they're attempting to commit suicide in a way that will make them famous. They're so hungry for recognition, mm -hmm. they're willing to end their life as long as somebody will know them, and somebody will know they pass through this earth. And so their loneliness turns into meanness and ultimately into villainy. And when you're lonely, you also lose the ability at this extreme end to see other human beings for who they are, as ensouled creatures that they are. And you see them basically as objects. And there's a quote I have in the book. A French journalist was interviewing people in, who had committed the Rwandan genocide. And she's asking a guy who had killed his neighbor of 25 years with a machete one day, just killed him. And she said, what did he look like when you took the machete to his neck? And the guy said, he didn't have the same facial features as the guy who I'd lived next to for 25 years. His, face, his facial features went sort of blurry and blank. And that's literal dehumanization, is not seeing the, another human face. And that's, I think, what drives a lot of these mass shooters. And what we can do, well, we live in a world without as much social density as we had before. And so we used to, in my view, live in a world with extended families where we lived with lots of people all around us. We lived in smaller homes, so people were noticing what we were doing. There was way higher church and synagogue and mosque participation. So we were just surrounded by people. There was less privacy, but people were around observing. And 
it's just been a case after case after case. When you look, at, you read into these mass shooters, in retrospect, somebody should have known. And often somebody did know. Often the family is warning the authorities, there's something wrong here with this person. They're, they're pent up, they're filled with homicidal rage. And for some reason, mm -hmm. even after all the shootings we've had, our society is not socially dense enough, and we're not looking out for each other enough, and we're not saying this is a dangerous situation, this is a bomb waiting to explode. And so it, it's shocking to me that after all the, these killings, we still have people who are homicidically lonely, and we're still sort of haven't filled in the social gaps so those people can just sit in their room and stew and stew and stew. And it, it's a indictment of, of our society and the lack of social connection, the not, lack of interrelationship. And sometimes I think, you know, there are weak moments where I think, you know, this is all because people aren't going to church. <laughs> and that's an exaggeration. But mm -hmm. you take the decline in church attendance, and suddenly you're, you're seeing this loss of social connection, the loss of social capital. And you're just seeing a country where people are not hanging out. And even worse, one of the things that church enables you to do or encourages you to do is when, say, somebody loses a loved one, if they're in your church, you know what to do. Like you show up with a casserole. There's a, it's institutionalized. And now if you're just with friends, when you lose a loved one, your friends may not know what to do. And so if you're in a mm -hmm. Jewish congregation, you lose a loved one, you sit shiva, which is, means you, you basically go to a party for seven nights after you lost your loved one. And that's not obvious that you've lost your spouse, so let's host a party for seven nights. But it's a brilliant ritual because it gives you something to do. You're super busy because you got to take care of all these people. You got to have the casseroles. People come over, you're surrounded by people for the whole week. And they the rule is you can either talk about the loved one or not talk about the loved one, but they're gonna be there just around you. And I think this, these churches and synagogues and congregations have ritualized ways of dealing with loss and suffering and loneliness that mere friendship doesn't have because it's not institutionalized. I don't know anybody, or I don't know very many people, who haven't had some kind of either broken friendship or divided church or divided uh, family, extended family, when it comes to the political situation in the United States over the last eight years or so. And we're headed into 2024. And I think there are a lot of people who are kind of on guard and are thinking, how do we... How are we going to get through this? And how are we going to get through this without pretending that there's not a lot at stake? I mean, this this is a different time than people arguing over Adlai Stevenson versus right, Mike. Right. <laughs> so there is a lot at stake. How would you advise people to try to get through 2024 without increasing the division yeah. in their their own homes or churches or anywhere. Well, my joke is that if you're if you're about to have a big family conversation that you think it might get fraud over politics, if you start the family conversation with the subject things I've always resented about you, and if you talk about that for an hour, by the time you get to <laughs> politics, it'll seem easier. So Festivus, yeah. the area of make, grievances. Make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> now, a few <laughs> tips that come to mind that are in the book. One is when you're having a disagreement keep the gem statement in the center. So the gem statement is the thing we agree upon underneath the things we disagree upon. If my brother and I are fighting over our dad's health care, we both want what's best for our dad. And if we keep returning to that thing we agree upon, the gem statement, then we'll preserve our relationship in the midst of disagreement. We both love our country. The second thing is find the disagreement under the disagreement. If we're having a dispute about Donald Trump, say, what is the thing deep down that is causing us to have such radically different views of Donald Trump? What experiences have you had? What experience have I had that cause us to see this differently? Suddenly, we're no longer fighting. We're exploring together the, the real roots of our disagreement. And that's just more fun and more productive. The third thing I would say is when somebody comes at me with critique, I've learned my, my first instinct is to try to be defensive. Yeah, hey, I'm not one of the good guys here. You know, I'm not one of the part of the establishment. I'm not one of those mm -hmm. people. But I've learned the important thing is to stand in their standpoint, to try to understand their point of view, to ask them three or four or five times, tell me more about your point of view. What am I missing here? Tell me more, tell me more. And if you can ask them four or five times, go deeper into what you're telling me. You may not persuade them and they may not persuade you, but you will have showed respect. And there's a great book I recommend called Crucial Conversations 
And the authors of those bo that book say, in any conversation, respect is like air. When it's present, nobody notices. When it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. So when I am asking about your point of view, at least I'm showing you respect. I'm being conscious of the fact that every conversation takes place on two levels. The subject we're nominally talking about, but then underneath there's the flow of emotions that's passing between us. With every comment we're making, I'm either making you feel more respected or less respected, more safe or less safe. And so it's important to pay more attention to that under conversation than the stuff we're nominally talking about in order to, to show some basic level of, you're a decent person, I'm not threatening you. And then finally, if the conversation goes bad and suddenly we're angry at each other, we can appreciate the fact that once we get angry at each other, our motivations deteriorate. We started the conversation wanting to persuade each other about some policy or about some candidate. But after we get mad at each other, our motivations are, I just want to show I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, I'm more powerful than you. And once our motivations deteriorate, we should stop talking because everything we say after that is going to damage the relationship. And I had a sad conversation with a guy. I told him this theory of mine. He said, yeah, that was the problem with my marriage. We didn't stop talking and our motivations deteriorated and we said things we can never make unsaid. And so sometimes mm -hmm. just if your motivations are down, stop, just stop. And the way you can rescue that is by doing something called splitting, which is what the conversation experts talk about, where you say, where you say what you were trying to do with your comment and you say what it, you were not trying to do. So I was trying to understand your point of view. I wasn't trying to demean you or silence you. And so if I say, here's what I was trying to do, here's what I wasn't trying to do, then that sets an occasion for us to reset our conversation and let's get it back on a healthy track. And so th those are a few of the random tips I've learned on how to be more skillful at conversations across political and other difference. I was talking a month or two ago to a Jewish woman, person of the left, who's way to the left of, of me. And she said, I think I understand those of you on the right, uh, more on the right, who were not, who are not on the Trump side of things better after October the 7th. She said, because I feel like people that I'd been in solidarity with, I'd been marching with them on all different kinds of causes that affected them. Suddenly when Hamas attacks innocent uh, Israelis, they have gone quiet or even made the kinds of arguments you think of the, the Ivy League presidents mm -hmm. testifying before uh, Congress the other day saying, well, you know, there's a context to the anti-Semitism. Do you think that's real in a way that it wasn't before in American yeah, history? Yeah, a thousand percent. You know, I'm ethnically Jewish. A lot of my friends and family, the rest of my family's all Jewish. And I would say this has been what you went through at the Southern Baptist Convention, what a lot of never Trumpers went through, they're going through the same thing. And I think in many ways, I wouldn't want to compare, but in an extremely shocking way. And for Jews, mm -hmm. you have to remember the, the history of Jews in the world is the history too often of Jews cowering beneath beds, cowering beneath tables, getting hacked to death, getting shot. And the entire point of the state of Israel is that that will never happen again. And so October 7th was just this searing sense that our attempts to overcome some of the oppressive natures of our history and this oppressive reality, that that would never end. That the, the claw of anti-Semitism would reach us everywhere and there'd still be Jews hiding under the table waiting to get killed. And so it was just this emotionally searing moment. And then for those on the left, to think, and Israelis feel like we're a small country surrounded by this gigantic Arab world. We're kind of vulnerable here. And then for those on the left to feel like we're marching with those who are fighting for justice, and suddenly we're labeled the bad guys. And I think it's a bit similar to what a lot of us who were never Trumpers were experiencing on the Trump side, because what the left was saying, and is saying to this day, is that there are two groups of people. There's the colonizers and the colonized. The oppressors are the oppressed. And frankly, a lot of things the Trump story they tell is there are two groups of people. There's the evil elites and then the common folk. And both of these things are basically Manichaean views where everybody is, where they tell a story where everybody's either on the good side of the innocents and the bad side of the elites. And one is a right-wing version and one is a left-wing version, but it's the same story that we don't need to know human beings here. We just know, are you in the group of the oppressor class or a group of the oppressed? 
in both cases, in the right and left-wing variety, it's really just a descendant from Marxist class struggle. And so I think a lot of mm. Jews were not prepared, progressive Jews were not prepared. They were going to be seen as the colonizer. And therefore, in some of the progressive minds, there was no spot in their mind for Jewish pain. There was no spot in their mind for a Jewish girl who was raped and shot in the head because they, she was a, a colonizer and therefore her pain could not possibly exist because she's the evil one. And so when people tell these Manichae and us them stories, they're distorting reality, distorting the world, creating these dehumanizing narratives. And I think this is for a lot of American Jews and a lot of American non-Jewish liberals. This is a shocking moment where they see how vast the difference is between a center left liberal and some of the more progressive folks on campus. It certainly seems like an especially precarious time, not just looking at Israel Hamas, looking at Russia, Ukraine, looking at the rise of some authoritarian adjacent figures around the world. Are we in a 1930s type situation right now? Or does it just seem that way? When you look at the next five or six years, I mean, obviously we don't know what's coming, but how hopeful are you about the next well, it's years. not been good. <laughs> We've had 25 years of yeah. democracy in decline. We've had 25 years of growing distrust. We've had uh, 25 years of rising populism. And so in some sense, you can say, oh, it looks like the 1930s, but the 1930s were worse. Like Adolf Hitler getting elected chancellor of Germany, worse. Mussolini, worse. Stalin, Lenin, Trotsky, worse. And so in all cases, I think things were worse then, and we shouldn't exaggerate. But history is not, is not over, that there is perpetually going to be a struggle between the forces of democracy and humanity and the forces of authoritarian and domination. There's always going to be a struggle between those of us who think we've actually made some progress as human beings. We have some rules. We have some norms. We have some basic codes of decency. And there are going to be other people who say, no, the, it's all law of the jungle here. The strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they most, must. And therefore, I, my rule is to grab anything I can. And that's sort of Donald Trump's mentality, in my view. And it's Vladimir Putin's mentality. It's Xi Jinping's mentality. I grab what I can. The rules don't apply. And so to me, that's, that's a step to barbarism. But the forces of decency or the forces of liberalism in the classic sense, I think are quite strong. And Vladimir Putin... You know, his assault on Ukraine, in my view, revealed his weakness. Hamas, right now they're popular among some deluded people in college campuses. But Hamas is not popular. Hamas is not popular in the Arab world. Hamas is not popular in the world. And their own homicidal nature makes their fundamental regimes fragile. And as best as I can tell, understanding what's happened in Gaza, frankly, in the last few weeks, as horrific as it's been... In my, as far as I can tell militarily, Israel is doing an extremely good job of defanging Hamas. And now you have Hamas terrorists surrendering by the score. And so this is not to say we're not in some struggle here. We're some elemental series of struggles to preserve what's best about our civilization. But I don't think we're in a moment where our civilization is threatened by foes of equal power, force, and might as the combined governments of Europe, North America, South America, Japan, Vietnam, to some degree, India. And so there, there's, in some sense, the good guys are, are stronger than before. And I, I will say w one thing. I've been helped in this past three years by a book I read during COVID called The Politics of Disharmony. And it was written by a political scientist, a great political scientist named Samuel Huntington. Huntington writes in that book, which he wrote in 1983, that there's this pattern, weird pattern in American history, where every 60 years calls a bolsh, and that's when people get power. Formerly marginalized groups demand to be included. A highly moralistic general. There's a new communications technology. And the public life is just nasty, contentious, polarized. And he said it happened in the 1770s with the revolutionary general. It happened in the 1830s with the age of Andrew Jackson and populism. Happened in the 1890s with the Industrial Revolution. It happened in the 1960s with all the turmoil of that era. And so writing in 1983, he says, I don't know if I believe in these 60-year cycles, but if they hold, then sometime around 2020, America will go through another moral convulsion. And I thought, pretty good. That's a pretty good prediction. Yeah. 
And so the good news of these convulsions is yeah. we go through a moment where we have to tear up our own culture because things aren't working anymore. But the good news is we pivot over, we create a new culture. Culture is a collective response to the problems of the day. And so I think we're in the middle of one of these bumpy periods, but we've been here before, and we'll hopefully create a new and healthier culture that'll help us live in greater peace than we have been for the last six years. As I read your book, David, one of the things that I thought about continually through it is the blessing from Aaron in Numbers 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That sense of God seeing you and, and, and a shining of the, the face. That's ultimately what this is all about. Yeah, and that was the prayer I prayed over my kids every Friday night when they were growing up. And, you know, the, the Bible is so wise on these matters. It's understanding of to know, to know a person. What is to know? And in our modern language, to know is sometimes seen as this rational scientific thing. I study you. I know you. But that's not how God knows us. God knows us with a, a kind of knowing that is that is emotional and rational and spiritual. It's a holistic kind of knowing. And when you look at the Bible through the, as I was working on this book, I kept coming again and again to dramas of recognition. Moments in the Bible where somebody is not seen and not recognized. And that's Isaac and Esau. That's obviously risen Christ is not recognized by the disciples. But most prominently, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's the injured guy on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people see him with their eyes, but they don't see him with their heart. And only the Samaritan sees with the heart. And so our ideal is to know the way God knows us, to know each other the way God knows us, to see each other with the eyes that Jesus would use to see us. And I, I can't get through any podcast without mentioning The Chosen. One of the things that show does very well is the actor who plays Jesus, his eyes are are warm and understanding and mature. And he looks at people with the eyes you'd want to be looked at. And that, that's sort of the, the model of, of how we are present with each other, with eyes of knowing love. The book is called How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others and Being Deeply Seen. David Brooks, is always great to talk well, to it's you. It's always great to be with you, Russell. Thank you. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Mackenzie Hill. Director of Operations for CT Media, Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Dan Phelps. Video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. Mm -hmm.